Turn with me in your Bibles to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, says, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we would ask for your blessing on our time together, that you would make your word effectual in the hearts of your people, both to save those who are yet strangers to your grace and to build up in grace those who have tasted the sufficiency of the blood of Christ. We pray, I pray, that I would preach for your smile and that your people would see your face as mediated through your word, that you would show us Christ, that we would magnify the grace of God in this wonderful work of regeneration, and that we would be more apt and ready to worship and serve you as you deserve because of it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to begin by asking what makes someone a Christian? A lot of confusion over, to the answer, over the answer to that question, even within the church. What makes someone a, a Christian? At the most fundamental level, what does it mean to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Many people would say that what makes someone a Christian is family tradition or heredity. If your parents and grandparents are Christians, well, then you were born Christian. Others would say that it's good manners and politeness and a pleasant attitude that makes you a Christian. Please and thank you, yes sir, no ma'am. Others would say that being a Christian means you fight poverty, you feed the hungry, you work for social justice. Others identify Christianity with a political platform. If you're for limited government, if you're against abortion and gay marriage, then you must be a Christian. Some people are a little bit more religious. They say that a Christian is someone who lives a moral life, someone who doesn't cheat on their spouse or cheat on their taxes, someone who doesn't abuse alcohol or drugs, someone who doesn't use foul language. Others would say you're a Christian if you read your Bible, pray to Jesus, attend church, fear judgment, and feel guilty for sinning. I'm here to tell you that none of those things makes a person a Christian, not a one of them. It's true that Christians mourn over their sin. It's true that Christians read Scripture, pray, and are members of local churches. It's true that Christians are faithful to their spouses, that they don't give themselves to drunkenness, and that they discipline their tongues. Christians do live changed lives, but not a one of those things makes them a Christian. Christianity is not so natural of a religion that you can be a Christian if you clean up your life and your language, parrot out a few memorized phrases, and show up at church once a week. Man's problem isn't that our thinking or our speech or our behavior, or our politics need to be refined a little bit here and there. No, something is so fundamentally wrong with us that Jesus says in John chapter 3, if we were to have any hope of seeing the kingdom of God, we need to be born all over again. The call of the gospel isn't behavior modification. Sin has so infected and corrupted mankind that nothing less than the wholesale renovation of the soul is required for salvation. As Charles Spurgeon aptly observed, the Scripture does not say, ye must be improved. 
but you must be born again. Consider the state that the natural man finds himself in. Every human being enters into this world dead in their trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1. By nature, sinful man is a spiritual corpse, entirely unresponsive to the spiritual truth proclaimed in the call of the gospel to repent from sin and trust in Christ for forgiveness. Because the natural man is totally depraved, sinners will always reject that good news. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the things of the Spirit of God are foolishness to the natural man, that he cannot understand spiritual things. Sin has so pervaded all of the natural man's faculties that everything, every part of his soul is corrupted by it. The mind is blinded, the heart is a heart of stone, and the will is enslaved to sin. And so preachers of the gospel are sent into the world of lost humanity to proclaim what Christ has accomplished on the cross for sinners and to offer Him to them by repentance and faith. But man's nature is so corrupt that no one believes. No one repents. Everyone rejects the gospel. Dead men do not decide to stop being dead. They don't have that capacity. They love their death. Their only hope for life resides entirely outside of them. And where does that hope come from? Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5 says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You see, in the exercise of God's sovereign pleasure, He issues this effectual call in the heart of the elect. He powerfully summons the sinner out of his spiritual death and blindness, and by virtue of the power that His Word has to create the realities that it calls for, He imparts new spiritual life. He gives the sinner a new heart. He gives him eyes to see and ears to hear. He effectually calls his people out of darkness and into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2, 9. And thus being made alive, God sovereignly grants them the gift of saving faith by which they lay hold of Christ and the salvation that he has purchased for them. This is the divine miracle of regeneration or the new birth. And this is what makes someone a Christian. Regeneration. The spiritual recreation of one dead in sin. The divine impartation of spiritual life into the soul of the sinner. Regeneration. That spiritual heart surgery performed by Almighty God wherein He removes your heart of stone and totally transforms you from the inside out so that your mind, your heart, and your will are entirely renewed. Your spiritual eyes, once blind to the glory of Christ, have been opened to behold the ugliness of sin and the beauty of holiness as it is comprehended in Jesus. The sin that once tasted sweet now brings nothing but bitterness And the righteousness and the virtue that you once had no taste for is now what you hunger and thirst after. You see, the Christian is the one who has been regenerated, made an entirely new creation from the inside out. Regeneration is the step in the Ordo Salutis that I've been assigned to teach on this afternoon. And what a privilege it is to open God's Word and expound on this most essential, most definitional aspect of Christian salvation. And while it's my normal practice to pick a specific text and work through that, uh, this afternoon I'm going to draw from a number of texts and address regeneration really as a whole. And we'll outline our discussion across four key points. First, we'll consider the author of regeneration. Whose work is the new birth? Second, we'll consider the nature of regeneration. What precisely do we mean by the term? What happens in regeneration? Third, 
We'll examine what Scripture says about the means of regeneration. By what means does regeneration come about? And then fourth, we'll investigate the relationship between regeneration and faith, which is a cause for much confusion in certain circles. So author, nature, means, and relationship to faith. Well, in the first place, then, let us consider the author of regeneration. Who accomplishes this work of the new birth? Well, from the comments we've made already, recapping man's total depravity, it should be plain that man cannot be the author, even the co-author, of this radical change of his own nature. He is entirely dead in sin. Now, the author of this creation, of spiritual life, where it had not existed, must be the creator of all life. It must be God alone. You know, some other aspects of the Ordo Salutis require the activity of believers. In conversion, even though repentance and faith are sovereign gifts of God, it is nevertheless true that sinners must turn from sin and trust in Christ. God grants repentance and faith, but He does not repent or believe the gospel for us. In sanctification, the believer's growth in holiness is a sovereign work of God. Philippians 2.13, it's God who is at work within you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And yet, believers don't just sit back and wait to be zapped to holiness. We are called to avail ourselves of the means of grace whereby the Spirit does that work. We are, Philippians 2.12, just the previous verse, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But the work of regeneration is unlike conversion and sanctification, where there is something for man to do. In regeneration, man is entirely passive. God alone is the sole active agent in bringing about this miracle of the new birth. Theologians call this position monergism, or they say that regeneration is monergistic. The term comes from the Greek word monos, meaning one, and ergon, which means work. And so it means that there's one agent at work. This, this position is uh, often con uh, contrasted with synergism, which takes the same word ergon, and instead of monos in front of it, uses the preposition soon, which means together with. So synergism speaks of working together. And when applied to regeneration, it means that man cooperates with God. God gives grace to the sinner, to be sure. But, they say, it is not an effectual grace. It's a resistible grace, which requires the sinner's cooperation. But by teaching that God alone is the author of regeneration, Scripture shuts us up to a monergistic, not a synergistic, doctrine of regeneration. And there are several biblical arguments for that. First, Scripture illustrates the reality of regeneration by employing the imagery of the new birth or being born again. John 3.3, 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then again in verses 5 and 6, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. And being born of water in the spirit is a reference to Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26, when, which describes the promise of regeneration in terms of sprinkling clean water and giving a new heart. So to be regenerated is to be born again. Peter uses this imagery in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 23. Uh, the Apostle John speaks of it as being born of God in 1 John 3, 9. So this means that sin has so infected and corrupted mankind that rearranging our life, modifying our behavior, multiplying our religious performances will accomplish nothing. Something, again, is so drastically and irreversibly wrong with us that we need to be born all over again. Sometimes you hear sinners make excuses. I was born that way. I was born this way with these desires, with these predilections. Jesus says, fine, you must be born again. But consider what this metaphor of the new birth means 
for the question of agency in regeneration. In the physical realm, a child makes absolutely no contribution to his own physical conception or birth. The child doesn't exist until he's conceived. And so he is entirely dependent upon the will of his parents to be brought into being. Well, in the same way, Jesus chooses this analogy of new birth to illustrate the reality that dead and depraved sinners cannot contribute at all to their spirit, to their rebirth unto spiritual life. They are entirely dependent on the sovereign will of God for regeneration. And besides that imagery, that illustration of new birth, Scripture explicitly affirms that regeneration is an act of God alone. In John 1.13, the Apostle John says that the children of God birthed in regeneration are born not of blood, nor of the will of man, or excuse me, of, of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To say that man is not born again by blood is to say that the new birth is not passed down hereditarily. Someone's heritage or ancestral lineage has no bearing on regeneration. While the joining of the blood of the father and mother produces physical life, it can never produce spiritual life. Regeneration is entirely supernatural. To say that man is not born again by the will of the flesh is to say that regeneration is not a product of the exercise of man's will. Sinful man simply cannot decide to be born again any more than a corpse can simply decide to rise to life. No moral effort or religious activity can induce the new birth because such acts would only be performed by the sinner while he was still in the flesh. And yet Jesus says in John 3, 6, that flesh can only give birth to flesh. And because the new birth is spiritual, it cannot come by the will of the flesh. Only spirit can give birth to spirit. And finally, John says that the child of God is not born of the will of man, which establishes that no man-made religion or no sacramental system can produce regeneration. Instead, the children of God are born of God. Scripture does not hesitate to employ the most active language in describing God's role in regeneration. Take these references down. In James 1.18, James writes, In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of firstfruits among His creatures. So far from depending on man's will, sinners are brought forth unto spiritual life by the exercise of God's will. In Ephesians 2, we just read it earlier, we're told man is dead, utterly helpless to bring himself to life, and while that was the case, God made us alive together with Christ. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, according to God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. That's very active language. Who caused our regeneration? God caused us to be born again. And I, I would like you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. How many times do you get to turn to Ezekiel in a sermon? And so if we're going to turn one place, we ought to turn here, where through the prophet Ezekiel, God promised a time where he would bring regeneration to his people. And in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27, God says this, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So the monergistic work of God in regeneration is unmistakable in this text. In just these three verses, God uses that phrase, I will, five times. Five times. 
and eight times if you count the implied verbs. The Lord is insisting that this spiritual heart transplant of regeneration is entirely his work. Then in the next chapter, Ezekiel 37, God illustrates his own sovereignty and man's helplessness by picturing the future regeneration of Israel as his breathing life into a valley of dry bones. This is the picture of man's natural state. He is no more able to bring himself to life than a pile of dead and dry bones could assemble themselves into a living flesh and blood human being. So in Ezekiel 37, 12, God says, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. Verse 14, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. It's unmistakable. The author of regeneration is God alone. That brings us, secondly, to the nature of regeneration. What precisely does it mean to be regenerated, to be born again? Well, the, the Greek term for regeneration is polygenesia. It actually occurs only two times in the New Testament. And uh, the first is in Matthew 19, 28, where Jesus tells his disciples, truly I say to you, that you who followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He uses the term regeneration to refer to the renovation of the creation that will occur in the eschatological kingdom of Christ. The second occurrence of the term comes from Titus 3.5, which I read at the beginning of the message here, where Paul says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So here, regeneration refers to salvation from sin, and it's characterized by both washing and renewal. That's fairly similar to John 3, 5, where John says that the new birth consists in being born of water and the Spirit, which we said, as before, is a reference to Ezekiel 36, where regeneration is described metaphorically as the sprinkling of clean water and the giving of a new heart. So from the uses of the biblical term then, we may conclude that the nature of regeneration is a cleansing from sin and a creation of spiritual life. It is a purifying renovation, a purifying renovation. At the most fundamental level, we could say that regeneration is this divine impartation of eternal spiritual life into the spiritually dead sinner. And Scripture gives numerous pictures of this. We've already seen the valleys, the valley of the dry bones. But in John chapter 11, as Jesus stands at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, who has been dead for four days, John 11:43 says, "The sovereign Lord cried out with a loud voice, "Lazarus, come forth." And verse 44 says, "The man who had died came forth." See, by the sovereign power of His word, Jesus authoritatively summoned Lazarus out of death and into life. So also does God command the spiritually lifeless corpse of the dead sinner to come forth out of his spiritual death and by the power, the sovereign power of his word, he effectually brings us to spiritual life. We heard much of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 earlier this morning where the God who said light shall shine out of darkness will shine into the heart of the dead sinner to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Into darkened hearts, God speaks the words, let there be light, and instantaneously births the light of spiritual life where there had been nothing but death. The command of God is the call that creates life. It is so sovereignly powerful that it creates the very reality that it commands. God does not summon or survey the cosmos to say, would you like to cooperate? Would you please like to obey the call to come into existence? Lazarus does not sit in the tomb queried by Jesus. Lazarus, come forth, that is, if you would cooperate with me. No, the call creates the life that it commands. And just as man's depravity was total 
Just as no part of our nature escaped the corruption of sin, but mind, heart, and will were all polluted, so also is regeneration in that sense total. No part of our soul escapes the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The natural man's mind is blinded, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. We are darkened in understanding, Ephesians 4.18, and therefore we cannot understand spiritual things, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Our affections are entirely disordered, John 3.19 and 20. We love the darkness and we hate the light. We delight in what's objectively repulsive and we are repulsed by what is objectively delightful. So driven by our affections, our wills obstinately refuse Christ and the glory of his gospel. John 5.40, you won't come to me. So intellectually, emotionally, and volitionally, man is captive to sin. But in the same way, renewal, the renewal of man and regeneration is as extensive as our depravity. In regeneration, the spirit opens the blind, the eyes, uh, the blind eyes of the mind. Acts 26, 18 speaks of conversion as the opening of their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. Romans 8, 5 to 9 speaks of how the mind set on the flesh is replaced with the mind set on the spirit so that the one who could not understand the things of God now, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, has the mind of Christ himself. And so he understands spiritual things and so the mind is renewed. The spirit also renews the sinner's heart. We saw it. He removes the heart of stone and in its place gives a heart of flesh, a heart that is capable of perceiving and loving the truth. He hungers and thirsts for the righteousness he once hated. He, the God he was once repulsed by, he now pants after and thirsts after like the deer pants for the water brooks. The Christ he once thought foolish and weak and a killjoy, he now trusts and treasures and rejoices in above everything else in the world. And so regeneration changes the heart, makes a man to love what is lovely, not which forces a man to do all the things that he hates and to reject all the things that he loves as if salvation were this ex exertion of willpower by our clenched teeth and gritted fists or gritted teeth and clenched fists we might just give it the old college try and just be miserable and true joy comes in heaven. No, no. Regeneration changes the heart so that we love what is truly lovely and hate what is actually hateful. And then with these renewed affections, the re regeneration also frees the sinner's will from the bondage of sin into the liberty of righteousness. God is at work within the regenerate heart both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so the cry of the newborn soul is Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. No longer merely on tablets of stone imposed from without, but on the fleshy tables of the heart, 2 Corinthians 3, whereby we love to do what we ought to do. Regeneration renews the mind, renews the heart, renews the will of man, which were once bound in sin and spiritual death, so that the regenerated sinner is truly, Ephesians 4.24, a new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And I really want to underscore this. I know Scott spent his, in, his time in 2 Corinthians 4, but that imagery of being dead in sin, darkened in mind, and then having the light of God shed abroad in the heart really is this key picture of regeneration where, again, we are loving darkness, hating the light, loving filth, despising beauty. We pursue what is worthless because we are blind to its detriment and we pursue or we refuse what is most precious because we are blind to its value. And the remedy for that condition is monergistic regeneration. 
the shining of this new spiritual light, the giving of new spiritual eyes so that we see sin. You understand what happens in conversion. Somebody turns on the lights so that now this sin that you are preoccupied with and just loving and, oh, this is so wonderful, the lights come on and you see this is a big pile of manure. This is disgusting. This is revolting. I want to get away. From, what am I doing with this? And then you see the disgust of sin and you look over here and here's, here's Jesus and you say, I recognize that one. He was the one that looked like that, that looked repulsive, that looked ugly, that looked, I don't want to be near him. Now I've got to go to him. That, that is beauty. That's love. That's everything that I've ever wanted. And you run after Jesus with the open arms and the, and the embrace of saving faith. That's what repentance is. I don't want this sin. That, that's what faith is. I need to lay hold of this Savior. So do you see, that's why we speak of irresistible grace. Not because God's grace can never be resisted. It's resisted all the time. Common grace is resisted all, all, all over the place. No, we, we speak of irresistible grace because in the irresistible grace of regeneration, God overcomes man's natural resistance to the gospel by opening his eyes to the glory of Jesus. Irresistible grace does not mean, as is often caricatured, that God coerces or forces man to repent and believe, kicking and screaming against his will. Get away from that manure pile and embrace this treasure. No, no, don't want to do it. That's not irresistible grace. Man's will is not violated in regeneration. Man's will is transformed in regeneration. It's freed from its bondage, the bondage of loving that filth. And so man who is naturally unwilling because of the bondage of his will is made willing in regeneration. That's a key phrase. It comes from the Westminster Confession, which explains this very well. It says, all those whom God has predestinated unto life and those only, he is pleased in his appointed time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them a heart of flesh renewing their wills and by his almighty power determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ Yet, so as they come most freely, being made willing by His grace. And so you see, we speak of irresistible grace because it's impossible that anybody with restored spiritual sight through regeneration, now seeing sin for what it is and, for, and seeing Christ for who He is, could do anything but turn and flee from sin and run to embrace Christ in saving faith. See, regenerating grace is irresistible at bottom because Christ is irresistible when seen rightly. Regenerating grace just opens our spiritual eyes to his irresistibility. Imagine what the opposite position says about Christ, that grace comes and helps you see that sin is as ugly as it is, that Christ is as glorious as it is, and the sinner could in that state say, no thanks, I prefer this. My sins are more lovely. My lusts and pleasures bring more satisfaction. Than him? Impossible. With eyes open to actually see. You say, this, this doesn't even hold a candle. What was I doing spending my life fooling with all this? when joy, infinite joy, was offered to me and held out to me the whole time. <clears throat> That's the nature of regeneration. What is the means? By what means does God accomplish this work? If he's the sole active agent, if he is the one in which, or if, if this is something that man is entirely passive in, what is this instrumental cause of regeneration? How does God accomplish this work? And the answer the Word gives is the Word. Scripture identifies itself, and especially the Word of God as preached in the gospel message, as the means of regeneration. 
See this in a number of places. We were in James 1 before, James 1.18. James says again, in the exercise of his will, that is the Father's will, there's monergism, language of sovereign grace. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth, there's the language of the new birth, regeneration, by the word of truth. There's the language of means, that preposition by tells us the means by which God accomplishes this action. And what is it? It is the word of truth. In 1 Peter 1, verse 23, Peter says, You have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through, another preposition of means, the living and enduring word of God. And then two verses later, he says, This living and enduring word of God is the word of which was preached to you. It is the gospel that he proclaimed to them. 2 Thessalonians 2.14, Paul says that God effectually called the Thessalonians to saving faith through our gospel. So it is by means of the preached gospel that the Spirit of God powerfully works to open the eyes of our hearts to the glory of Christ. The external call of, the, of gospel preaching is the vehicle for the internal call of regeneration. And so this is why Paul says in Romans 10, 17, so faith, which is the immediate result of regeneration, faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, which is to say the gospel message concerning Christ. Means of regeneration is the word, the proclamation of the gospel. And if we really understood that theological truth, even as Scott said earlier, it would be the end of all pragmatism in ministry. So many churches, especially in America, have bought into the lie that it is their job to manipulate the heart and mind of the sinner so as to shut him up to decide for Jesus and, and, to, and to believe and thereby to be born again. And so these folks rack their brains to come up with the, these clever presentations, the most compelling evidence and arguments and, and, and the most entertaining church services also that the sinner will make that decision, will throw that pine cone in the fire and, make it, and become a Christian. But we learn from these passages that we've just read that those things are not what opens a sinner's blind eyes. Theatrical lighting, cutting-edge music, cultural savvy, even our own good works and politeness, none of that will ever open blind eyes so that sinners would treasure the glory of Jesus. None of it. The only means by which the sinner's blind eyes are opened in the new birth is the word of truth. The gospel of forgiveness of sins freely offered by faith in a sin-bearing, wrath-propitiating substitute. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, then our evangelistic strategy need go no further than we preach Christ. If his sheep hear his voice and a stranger they won't follow, we need do nothing but sound the shepherd's voice in the call of the gospel. And his sheep will come into his fold by his own sovereign power. And not only does this reality rule out all ministerial pragmatism, it also rules out any sacramental view of regeneration. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, some strains even of Lutheranism and Anglicanism teach baptismal regeneration, that the grace of the new birth is mediated through the sacrament of baptism. But this is just not so. The means of regeneration is not the water, it's the Word. John 3, 8 says, the Spirit is like the wind that blows where it wishes. That's an image that's entirely incongruous with tying regeneration to a ritualized, physical act of human will like baptism. You can schedule a baptism. You can't schedule regeneration. The wind blows where it wishes. The whole point of that word picture is that the spirit is entirely unconfined, uncaptured by the, uh, any human act. But in baptismal regeneration, what would you have? You would have the wind confined to the sacrament. The wind blows where the priest wishes. Not so. When Jesus speaks of being born of water and the Spirit, we've said it a couple times already, he's not referring to Christian baptism, which Nicodemus would have had no concept for. 
but of the promise in Ezekiel 36, which this, this V teacher of Israel certainly would have been familiar with, this new covenant promise of the law on the heart where there is sprinkling and heart change. And so there is no biblical support for pragmatism. There is no biblical support for baptismal regeneration. The gospel itself is the sole instrument, the sole means of the new birth. And that brings us, fourthly, to a key question concerning regeneration, and that is, what is regeneration's relationship to saving faith? Which produces which? Does the sinner believe in Christ for salvation and, as a result of his faith, get born again, as a popular TV preacher would tell you? Or, on the other hand, is the sinner born again unto saving faith, which induces the other? Does man's act of faith bring about the Spirit's work of regeneration? Or does the Spirit's work of regeneration bring about man's act of faith? And in numerous ways, Scripture answers in favor of the latter. Regeneration is the cause, not the consequence, of faith. And as we address this question, it's necessary to remember what we've said regeneration is here. It is this purifying renovation. It is this divine impartation of spiritual life. Sometimes when people answer this question wrongly and say that regeneration is the consequence of faith, they define, they're speaking of regeneration as if it was the same as sanctification. The, the idea that regeneration is this ongoing process by which the sinner's nature is progressively regenerated more and more to reflect the image of Christ. Now that's something that's real in the Christian life. Sanctification is progressive and it certainly follows faith. But that's not what regeneration means. And it's not how Scripture uses the term. Again, John 3, 8 tells us the wind blows where it wishes. It's mysterious. It's unobserved. It's uncontainable. We might perceive the effects of the wind. We might hear, hear the gust or we might see the trees shift uh, from side to side, but those results of the wind are not the wind itself. And in the same way, the results of regeneration, like progressive conformity to the image of Christ, are not regeneration itself. You could say that sanctification is organically linked to regeneration. Regeneration is sanctification begun. Sanctification is regeneration continued. They're inextricably linked, but they're not to be confused with one another. Another thing to say is that when we say that regeneration precedes faith, what we don't mean is that it precedes faith in terms of a time gap. We're speaking in terms there of logical causality. Some theologians don't believe that regeneration causes faith because they want to avoid the scenario of having an unregenerated, or excuse me, a regenerated unbeliever, right? That there's somebody who's experienced regeneration and not had saving faith. And they're right to want to avoid that. that. That is not biblical. There is no such thing as a regenerate unbeliever. But we're not arguing that regeneration temporally precedes faith. We're speaking of a logical rather than a chronological order. From a temporal perspective, regeneration and faith occur simultaneously. In the exact moment that man is born again, he repents and believes the gospel. But listen, that simultaneity, that happening at the same time, that temporal sameness, does not rule out any room for causality. We would acknowledge, wouldn't we, that two events may occur, at, may occur at the exact same time, and yet one still caused the other. Consider that imagery that Paul employs, again, in 2 Corinthians 4, where regeneration is defined by the opening of the sinner's blinded spiritual eyes so that he sees the light of Christ's glory. In that text, Paul pictures regeneration as the opening of blind eyes. And he pictures faith as the spiritual sight, the spiritual perception of Christ's glory. If your eyes were closed so that you could see absolutely nothing, then you opened your eyes, well, which comes first? The act of opening your eyes or perceiving light? Well, the answer is neither comes first. We perceive light in the very same moment that we open our eyes. No, time passes between our opening our eyes and perceiving light. The definition of having open eyes is that light's going into them. They are temporally simultaneous actions. 
But which action is the cause of the other? Do we open our eyes because we begin to perceive light? Or do we see because our eyes have been opened? Certainly we see because our eyes have been opened. Our sight is the consequence of opening our eyes. In the same way, even though they occur in the same moment, the spiritual sight of faith does not cause regeneration. The opening of the sinner's spiritual eyes in regeneration is the cause of the spiritual sight of faith. And so regeneration, as I said before, is the cause, not the consequence, of faith. But even besides that, besides pressing into the details of that biblical metaphor, Scripture's teaching concerning the depravity of man, our natural spiritual inability, precludes any notion that faith would bring regeneration rather than vice versa. Again, we are incapable of even understanding the things of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2.14, let alone receiving them. Romans 8, 7 says the sinner's mind is so hostile to God that he is literally unable to submit to God's law. And therefore, Romans 8, 8 says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, surely we would all agree that it pleases God for sinners to believe in Jesus. But if those who are in the flesh cannot please God and saving faith pleases God, then those who are in the flesh cannot exercise saving faith. They need to be born of the Spirit. Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The sight of the kingdom of God can refer to nothing other than the spiritual sight of saving faith. And Jesus says that sight is impossible apart from the new birth. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6, 65, no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. No one can come to Jesus in saving faith unless the Father grants the gift of being effectually drawn in regeneration. And some synergists famously reply to this that, well, drawing doesn't mean dragging, and so it's disingenuous to represent the Father's action, uh, you know, his drawing here as effectual drawing. He says that he, the Father draws by persuasion, not determination. But interestingly, the Greek word helko translated draws in John 6.44 often refers to a decisive, effectual movement just like dragging. John uses the term to refer to fishermen hauling in a fishing net full of fish in John 21, 6 and 11. In John 18, 10, he uses the term for a soldier drawing his sword from his sheath in the midst of battle. In Acts 16, 19, Luke uses the word to describe angry men dragging a foreigner before their court. And again, in Acts 21, 30, to speak of a mob dragging a traitor out of their city. So, so far from an ineffectual wooing, the Father's drawing in, in, in John 6.44 is the decisive, effectual calling of monergistic regeneration. And I can't even think about this verse without remembering the story that, that R.C. Sproul told as he had a debate with another professor who said drawing, is, he found this reference to the term drawing uh, in ancient Greek literature where men are drawing water out of a well where he says, you don't compel the water to get out of the well, like, and the water comes up. And Sproul says, but neither do you peer down the well and go, here, water, water, water. <laughs> you throw the bucket down there, and you pull the, the rope to pull it up. Now, besides all of that, I want you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. The Apostle John comments explicitly on the relationship between regeneration and faith. It's important that we know this. And while it's true that he's not here intending to teach on the Ordo Salutis, he's instructing the churches of Asia Minor to love one another, his comments nevertheless reveal his understanding of the relationship between regeneration and faith. 1 John 5.1, and I'm going to quote from the Legacy Standard Bible here, a little plug, because uh, it does a better job of giving the uh, literal translation in this particular verse than the New American Standard. John writes, 
everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now, everyone who believes is a present participle. It indicates present continuous action, something that's going on. Has been born is a perfect indicative, which indicates past action whose results continue into the present. So John says that everyone who is presently believing that Jesus is the Christ now has been, prior to that, born of God. He represents faith, presently believing, as the consequence of the new birth, not its cause. Do you see that? That is absolutely huge in this discussion of the Ordo Salutis. And this reading of the grammar is confirmed by examining several parallels in the same letter. There are two other identical instances where John uses a present active participle alongside a a perfect passive indicative to illustrate the relationship between the new birth and its results. So look at chapter 2, verse 29. John says, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness, there's your present participle, has been born of him. That is the precisely the same grammatical construction as in 5.1. So what's John teaching here? That a habitual pattern of practiced righteousness is evidence that the new birth has taken place. And the causal relationship between the practice of righteousness And the new birth ought to be obvious to everyone in here. If there's anything that Scripture teaches plainly, it's that man is not born again as a result of doing good works, as a result of practicing righteousness. Paul explicitly denies that in Titus 3, 5, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but by the washing of regeneration. So the relationship is clear. The impartation of new spiritual life in regeneration is the cause of an ongoing practice of righteous deeds. And then in 1 John 4, 7, John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Again, the exact same grammatical construction. 229, practice of righteousness. 4, 7, one act of righteousness, uh, in particular, love. And again, does one love in order to be born again? Or is one born again unto a life of love? Well, certainly the latter. Otherwise, we would, have, we would undermine the gospel of salvation by grace alone. So let's put it this way. We must conclude that practicing righteousness in 229 and loving the brethren in 4.7 are the consequences, not causes of regeneration, or we deny the gospel. We must also conclude that whatever relationship practicing righteousness and loving the brethren have to regeneration, saving faith has that same relationship because 229, 4, 7, and 5, 1 are identical grammatically. Therefore, just as practicing righteousness and loving the brethren are consequences, not causes of regeneration, so also is faith the consequence rather than the cause of regeneration. So, biblical pictures, babies don't make themselves born. We don't open our, we don't see in order, we don't perceive light in order to see, in order to open our eyes. The, man, the implications of man's total depravity, how is anybody going to exercise faith while they're dead? And the explicit comments of Jesus and the Apostle John, the student of Scripture has to conclude that while regeneration and faith are experienced simultaneously, regeneration logically precedes faith and is its cause. Sinners don't believe in Christ in order to be born again. They are born again unto saving faith. R.C. Sproul once said, the entire cause of the Reformation can be boiled down into one phrase, regeneration precedes faith. It's a big deal. But the question we've got to ask ourselves as we study these things is, first of all, has this great miracle happened to me? Am I a new creation? Have I experienced 
this radical disruption of everything in my life? Has the Holy Spirit leveled to the ground everything I sought my identity in? Has he given me new eyes to see the glory of Christ? Has he given me ears to hear the wisdom of divine truth? Has he removed my heart of stone and given me new desires and new loves and new inclinations and new ambitions? Has he given me a heart of flesh that hates sin and that loves righteousness? Is Christ precious to me? Is he my pearl of great price? Is he my treasure hidden in a field for whom I would gladly suffer the loss of all things so that I might gain him? Have I been born again? And if not, if you survey your heart and the answer that your heart speaks to you, testifies to you is no, dear friend, cry out to God. No, you can't constrain the wind, but you can get on your face and lift your voice to heaven and beg God to be merciful to you, a sinner, that the sovereign wind of the Spirit might blow over your heart and open your eyes to the loveliness of Jesus. Whatever you do, do not try to convince yourself that there is spiritual life where there is only death. Don't try to fabricate this new creation by trying to clean up your life and, and make a few minor changes, a shift or two in your social calendars. You don't listen to the same music. You don't watch the same TV. No, you can't engineer the radical supernatural change that must take place in your heart. You can't raise yourself from the dead, but Christ can. And he calls you, like he calls Lazarus, to come unto him. He lived the perfect life of righteousness that you were commanded to live and failed to live. He died the substitutionary death under the heavy hand of the wrath of God on the cross in the place of sinners, the very death that you deserve to die. He was risen. He rose from the grave on the third day in victory over sin and death to testify that all has been accomplished, that nothing more is needed except that you come to Him in repentance and faith. For everyone who believes has been born of God. May God be gracious. Let's pray. Dear Holy Spirit, would you blow in your sovereign freedom over this church building right here and to all within the sound of my voice, would you grant new spiritual life where there was only darkness? Would you call into being that which does not exist? Lord Jesus, would you summon your lost sheep into your fold. God, we pray that you would do the work, the miracle of regeneration. And we who have received that miracle, we bow our hearts in humble worship to say thank you for summoning us to life when we were dead, for doing what we refused, not only couldn't do, but what we, which we refused to do, even though you came and spoke peace to us, by the gospel, we refused you still, and yet you made us alive in great love. Would you get the return from our hearts that you are worthy of for such a work? Would you make us eager and thirsty to see that work accomplished in our friends, in our neighbors, in our family members, in the unbelievers that you have given us the privilege of interacting with in this world? Would you do it to make the name of Christ famous, that we might have a, a front row seat to the work of God and salvation because we are the proclaimers of that message of reconciliation? We ask in Jesus' name, amen.